our newest exhibit. It's a free flight aviary, and one of the really cool things about it is that you can walk right on through and see some of the birds up close. Now, the pond hall area that we used to do is this area is in South America, and it has one of the largest collections, or collections, but one of the largest um, areas of species and it's one of the biggest wetlands in the world. It has so many different species that in many cases are only found in those areas. Now all of the birds that you'll see today are from South America and they're all found surrounding this Pontinol area. Really exciting. It's like I said, it's the largest wetland on earth and when you visit the Houston Zoo, a portion of your ticket supports people saving there. So the Houston Zoo actually has organizations that they work with in the pot and all one of the people that we'll be seeing to, or one of the uh, animals that we'll be seeing today is one of the species that are critical and are one of the animals that we are helping directly over in the wild so if you're ready we will go inside Locking it is important too. <laughs> They do sort of stay inside, but oh, there we go. And actually, you're going to get a special treat today. We're going to go a little even further behind the scenes to an area where the guests would have gone. that you'll probably see out here are a green or a pendula. We have a flock of about 15. We have four boys and 12 girls. And I know that's 16. <laughs> but what you can see there is that they are building these nests. We have an even larger group up here. It is one of the really unique things that they do is they make these amazing nests. They will build them completely on their own. That's one of the most common questions when people come in here is do we build them for the birds? And the answer is no. We put in like the nesting material over here. We have some palm fronds that they'll actually take strips off of it, but they will build these nests completely on their own. Yeah, in fact, you can see them working on it right now. So my coworker Kelly here actually has an example 
example of one of what one of these nests looks like up close. This one, it was one of the early attempts. Um, they made it mostly out of hay, which wasn't quite as strong. Since then, we've been giving them a little bit sturdier materials. So it happened to fall down with the wind, but there was nothing in it. It was totally fine. But you can see just how large it is. When they're way up high, you can't necessarily tell that it's so big. But the birds, though, usually they'll just sort of start to pop and they'll work their way down. And they make this really beautiful cavity. I don't know if it'll come through. But it's like a nice little bowl in there. And it's really, really strong. And the female, she will lay her eggs inside and she will stay in there with the chicks and then raise them. It can take a little while. Um, it can take about 17 days for the eggs to hatch and then almost a month for the fledglings to come out. So that's why it's really important that they build these strong so they can hold up to all sorts of weather. other birds in here is right around the corner here. These are wattled curassows. This is actually the bird that I was just talking about that is endangered and is one of our um, conservation partners in South America. We also have the bluebill curassow which is over in our cliffs exhibit and that bird is critically endangered. This one is endangered too. But they're really, really exciting. The Houston Zoo has a great history of working with the conservation efforts of these curassows. Our curator, Chris, is uh, actually, he was able to go over to Columbia, um, where the bluebill curassow is native to, and uh, was able to help the, the conservations over there. He was able to help, um, help the people who are working with them to help breed the birds to get them to survive and also to work on um, just finding ways to help conserve and to help them come back from the wild. Right now what we're doing um, is we have also set up uh, camera traps over there. And uh, in the camera traps, it, I guess it sounds a little weird, but it's just a, a camera that's set up with a sensor and we will try to uh, get pictures to categorize what birds are in each area and they get a lot of other animals too so we've seen some really amazing animals some that we didn't even know were there um, and we'll see like ocelots and capers and really awesome animals in addition to the the ones that we're looking for so what i just did was i tossed them peanuts they love peanuts that's our boy in front chowing down. That's the girl right behind him. You can tell him, the male from the female because he has that really impressive waddle, the little knob on the side of it, on the top of his head. He's a little bit more discreet, but uh, he's very handsome. Normally in the wild, they would mostly eat fruit, bugs, um, a wide variety of things, uh, but definitely here in the Houston, the peanuts are nice. Another person that uh, has a lot of uh, experience with the curacao is our bird supervisor, Kelly. He, uh, he's the stud bookkeeper for um, a few different species, including the waddled curacao. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so um, uh, unless Stephanie mentioned this while I was away, I went to actually grab um, to show you guys kind of what one of their eggs looked like. Um, so you can kind of see up close here. Um, so this was one of their eggs. It was an egg that, um, you know, wasn't fertile. There's no development. So we were able to kind of take it and use it as an item to show people. So um, it might not be very easy to see, but um, on this egg, there is a little bit of texture there. So there's a little bit of kind of almost like a chalkiness to it that can't really be seen, but um, these are their eggs. So those guys um, in the wild and curacaos, you know, in general, they'll, um, when they're nesting, they'll lay one egg and then two to three days later, they'll lay a second one um, and they'll start incubating these eggs. So um, it's possible for these guys um, to have, you know, one to two chicks is pretty, it's what's gonna be normal for these guys um, in, in the wild. Um, so here at the zoo, um, you know, we do have birds that'll parent rear, but some that, you know, maybe don't have that experience or um, we aren't really sure um, if they um, are ready to or not. Um, we can actually pull some of their eggs. So with curassows, 
um, we actually use domestic chickens to incubate some of their eggs. So um, a little pun, no tangent, but um, so even uh, the domestic chickens that we have here are helping to save, um, you know, animals in the wild by kind of incubating some of their eggs. And they'll also incubate some eggs for our Atwater's Prairie Chicken, which is a conservation program we have here. So um, really effective um, uh, helpers in our, uh, our tool set, you know, having the chickens that'll kind of take care of those birds for us. So, um, and these guys, um, from day one, so, or day zero, so once they hatch out, their chicks are able to actually perch, um, uh, right on perches, which is not necessarily normal for a lot of like brown birds or other birds. So, um, it's pretty neat. Their chicks are what's called precocial. So pretty much from day one, they're up and they're ready to go. They're covered and down. Um, a lot of feathers so that way they can follow their parents around you know on the ground foraging for food um, once they're ready and looking for good stuff to eat yeah that's a, a contrast to the birds that i was telling you about before the orpendulas they're what we call attritial birds and that's just a fancy way of saying that the babies are usually a little bit they need a little bit more care a lot of the times the reason for that is that they are approaching birds that will be up in trees most of the time and they'll have their nests up high too. And so because of that, they're not on the ground, they're not quite as vulnerable to predators and the parents are able to hide them and really spend a lot of time caring for them and making sure that they have time to develop. They'll usually have smaller eggs um, because they're up high. Um, and also because uh, they will be smaller when they hatch, they have more time to develop. The ones on the ground usually need to be bigger because they have to survive right off the bat. Oh, another bird, right, right down here, we have our southern lapwings. They're really, really cool. Uh, they are another um, ground bird where their chicks are more precocial. And earlier this year, they actually had some eggs. In fact, actually, this is uh, the dad right here. And what he's doing is he's not really sure of what's happening. So he is sort of like crouching down, sort of pretending like he might be hurt. The reason why they would do that is in the wild, they want to make themselves look more vulnerable. So the predator might go after them. And when they do that, they actually will lead the predator away from the nest. And then of course there's nothing wrong with them. So once the predator is further away from the nest, they'll just fly away. So he's a little nervous and he's like, oh, oh, you look at me and don't look at my, <laughs> my nest and my girlfriend over there. And what I have here actually is one of the eggs that they had. You can see it's this dark brown color. with a little bit of the, the modeling. That's more common with, uh, with ground birds because they want to be able to blend in with the ground floor. This one um, was actually, it was laid out here. Unfortunately, it wasn't fertile, um, so that's why we, we took it away. But these birds, they have had fertile eggs in the past and they actually have had chicks. So um, they, the chicks that they had earlier, actually, they're behind the scenes right now. And one of the things that is interesting about these birds is, you know, they're really, really good parents. And they can also be very, very protective of their nest, which is understandable. But they have gotten perhaps a little too protective sometimes. So we um, are thinking about possibly um, taking them behind the scenes later. So they can have a little bit more privacy to raise their young. And then the babies that they had earlier might come out here and be little surrogates. It's really exciting how the the circle goes of just um, how birds, they've just adapted in so many ways and they have blended in here so well that they have felt comfortable nesting. We're really, really excited about that. The same thing with the oropendulas that I pointed out earlier. Um, there are, there's a good chance that there are eggs in these nests. They've been sitting on them and so we are hoping that uh, babies will pop out. It's a little difficult for us to be certain because they are up so high, but we keep track really carefully of which birds are going in and out and everything that they're doing. Now, you might have noticed that these birds, some of them look a lot alike. That's especially true with our orpendulas. The reasons that we can tell them apart is they all have different colored leg bands that we can look at a binoculars and we can tell them apart that way. And that's how we'll be able to really track who's who 
and also make sure that everybody is doing well. One quick follow-up from a question that we had from Facebook Live earlier. Um, someone was actually asking about the um, that reddish-orange coloration um, on the, the um, waddle carousel we've got right here. So um, that actually is um, a waddle um, on the male, and then kind of a little knob on top. So they're basically just kind of little fleshy appendages. They're you know not all that different than you would see on um, you know like a rooster or on a turkey stuff like that. So um, largely decorative. Um, you can use it for display and stuff like that as well. But um, just to kind of answer that question that someone had had. You can see it is the male that has that, and the female doesn't really have it quite as prominent on her. Hers is more just normal beef. He needs to be handsome to impress her. Rachel also asked a question a little bit ago. We could see a really interest, or we could hear a really interesting sound in the background. It was kind of a bloop, 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 bloop. That was a sound. It probably didn't do that very well, and I apologize. Um, but that sound was actually our male green orm pendula. He was putting on a display. It's a really fun sound that they make, and it is exactly the same thing as Kelly was saying with the waddled curses, that they're trying to impress the girls. So they will do this really beautiful little dance to try to, you know, show the ladies, hey, I I'm really nice, and, and they'll choose him. bird. This is one of our boys. We have three boys and two girls. <laughs> and the reason we have more boys than girls is actually very similar to what we were just saying is this type of bird, it's known as a liking species, which is a fancy way of saying that the boys really need to work to get the girl's attention. So this type of bird will come out in the morning and they'll put on these elaborate displays, all of the boys together, and the girls will basically see them and pick out the ones that they like best. So he's beautiful. The girls, they're not quite as pretty. They're more of a brown color because they'll typically be raising the young. So they'll um, actually make their little burrow. And they're called Andean Cock of the Rocks because they'll actually make their nest in cliff sides. They'll actually sort of pick out a hollow. They'll build it up with mud and, and sticks and clay and kind of make it secure and then they will lay their eggs inside and stay with the chicks. And then the boys will go on being pretty and, uh, and trying to impress more girls. And you can see they have really interesting feathers on their heads. One of the common questions that we get is, um, is their skull shaped like that? Because you know, it's so weird, you can hardly even see their beak. But the answer is no. They have a fairly normal shaped bird skull and a, a normal sized beak. They have those beautiful feathers that come down over the front of their face. It's a little bit like an Elvis bird. And you can see that they, uh, <laughs> they definitely know how to flaunt it. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us at Pontinol and our Savannah Aviary. We hope that you can come visit us at the Houston Zoo. Thank you for tuning in. And have a good day. Um, we will be back next Wednesday at 11 a.m. with another really exciting thing for you to see on Facebook Live. And one more thing, um, just so you know, um, even by purchasing a ticket and coming here at the Houston Zoo, you're actually helping save animals in the wild. So, Absolutely. Um, the, some of the proceeds of those tickets actually go to those conservation projects, like Bethany mentioned earlier, you know, um, helping the blue-billed curacaos, or whether it's with tapers or jaguars or um, any project that we're helping out with here at the Houston Zoo. So, uh, yeah, thank you so much again for stopping by. Yeah, thank you so much, and have a great day.